All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just removed my mask, and I want to thank Rod for the kind introduction, and thank you to all the viewers who are tuning in. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Jessica Glass, and I'm happy to be here on the Trathyeta campus on the land of the Lower Tanana Dene people. And as uh, Rod alluded to this evening, I'm going to be talking about DNA and uh, mammoths and museums. Um, but my day job is in the fisheries uh, department of CFOS. I'm an Alaska EPSCOR faculty member. I'm part of the Fire and Ice Coastal Margins team. And if you tuned in last week to Dr. Gwen Hennan's awesome talk, she would have told you a lot about the Coastal Margins team and the types of questions we're answering. So a lot of my work um, now that I've returned here to, to Alaska has to do with uh, fisheries and genomics and climate change. And with the Coastal Margins team, I'm actually collecting water samples and analyzing DNA in, in the, of organisms like fishes and invertebrates in the water that span those um, glacial gradients. This is um, a picture of me holding a jack. <laughs> they kind of look like tunas, um, but as we'll get to in a second, they're not really related. And I've done a lot of research in, in South Africa. Um, this picture was taken in the Seychelles islands. And um, I like to, to apply genomics across uh, my field to answer a bunch of different questions. And that's kind of the beauty of, of evolution and, and DNA. There's a, lots of, a lot of different applications of genomics to answering scientific questions, like screening for diseases or understanding how many species there are, which is a big question that I answer. How, why are there so many species of fishes in, this ocean, in the oceans? And how are they able to coexist at the same time? And even people are using DNA and genomics to, to try to bring back extinct species. Um, and so genomics and DNA have, has revealed some very surprising findings about the tree of life. So for example, some of the work uh, that I do is, like I said, focused on fishes and understanding the tree of life. And one of the surprising findings that DNA has, um, has shown is that tunas, um, the clade containing tunas, is actually more, tunas are actually more closely related to seahorses than they are to the billfishes, the swordfishes and the, um, the marlins, even though they're found in a lot of the same habitats. Those billfishes are actually closely related to the group that I study, the Jackson Trevallis, um, which in turn share a common ancestor with the flatfishes. Um, and because all of life has, shares a common ancestor, we can use genomics to answer all sorts of questions um, spanning the tree of life. And so you might be wondering what a fisheries biologist is going to be <laughs> talking about mammoths. Um, and that, of course, relates to this topic of surprising findings and using uh, one method to examine lots of different questions about the tree of life. So on the menu for today um, is a story and a journey. And that journey is going to take us all the way from Alaska to New York City, uh, we're going to talk about woolly mammoths. Charles Darwin is going to play, <laughs> make a cameo. Uh, naval commanders, giant ground sloths, DNA, of course, uh, explorers, an infamous impresario, and museums and libraries. And you might think, wow, in 45 minutes, like that's everything except for the kitchen sink, right? Except we're going to talk about the kitchen sink too, because or maybe I should say kitchen stove, because there is uh, cooking in this talk as well. Um, and I wanna, I wanna quickly, or first actually say that the work I'm about to talk about um, was not a, um, a one man or one woman effort. Um, this, these are my team members and I wanna just briefly introduce them because this was one of the most amazing parts of this project which ended up being kind of a side project that um, I, I did during my dissertation work, during my PhD at Yale in Connecticut. So I want to acknowledge Matt Davis, um, now Dr. Matt Davis, who's at the LA County Museum. He played an integral part in this project and did a lot of the archival research um, and was a great collaborator to work with. Gisela Kakoni is at Yale and she runs the Center for Genetic Analyses of Biodiversity. Uh, another team member was Tim Walsh, who's at the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut. And then Eric Sargis was um, also on this team, and he is an anthropology professor at Yale and also um, the curator of mammalogy at the Peabody, the Yale Peabody Museum. Um, and the way all of this got, the whole thing got started was when I was an undergraduate at Yale, I was working in the museum. Uh, 
now several, several years ago, and I worked as an undergraduate in the collections, and the Peabody Museum really got me excited about, um, it introduced me to fishes. It got me excited about museums and collections, and I'm gonna pause there and come back to kind of that um, story specifically of working in the museum, but I first wanna ask the audience, um, whether you're on Zoom and chat or Facebook in the comments, whether you have a favorite museum, and why is it your favorite? And for me, the Peabody has a special place in my heart because as a student, I could go and during lunch break, just um, go and explore and relax and look at life. Uh, you know, we have the Museum of the, of the North right here, right next to my office. And I love wandering in there um, for reasons other than just getting coffee in the middle of the day. So take a minute and I'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts about your favorite museums. Um, but. First, I'm gonna continue on my journey as you're writing in the chat. We're gonna start out in New York City. Um, this is a picture of the Explorers Club headquarters. Um, you can see it's kind of a very elegant and perhaps antiquated old building. Uh, and the Explorers Club was founded in 1904 to promote exploration and field-based research. And the club is famous for uh, the many achievements of its members, such as being the first to the North and South Poles, the top of Everest, and the surface of the moon. Um, I don't know if anyone in the audience has been to the North Pole or the top of Mount McKinley. You can put that in the chat if you have those claims to fame. Um, but some of its famous members, of course, include Matthew Henson, Neil Armstrong, Teddy Roosevelt, Sylvia Earle, um, Jacques Cousteau, astronaut Kathy Sullivan, and yet one of the most um, arguably famous kind of ways that the, that the Explorers Club is known is through its annual uh, gala dinners. Um, this was the, a picture I took in 2019 at the annual dinner, which occurred um, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the moon, Apollo moon landing. And on stage and the invitees of the dinner were um, several of the Apollo astronauts who got to share their favorite stories from space. And another big part of these annual dinners, since the sort of the inauguration of the club, is that um, they also feature these exotic and unique appetizers. Before the dinner starts, uh, they serve things like tarantulas and invasive python and cockroaches and goat eyeballs and roast muskrat. And this is the fair that is, um, that is known. And, and it's sort of become, made the, made the club famous um, because of these exotic dishes. And, and in recent years, I should say that they, they really focused on serving invasive species um, and showing how you can utilize invasive species uh, in your meals. Um, so although strange food has been a tradition at the club for a long time, by far the most exotic dish ever served was at the annual dinner, the 47th annual dinner in 1951. This is, I believe, the Roosevelt Hotel. And at that dinner, yep, it was at the Roosevelt Hotel, along with a, with a fairly traditional course of Pacific spider crabs and bison steaks and green turtle soup and exotic cheese straws, there was one hors d'oeuvre that got everyone talking, and that was frozen mammoth meat that was supposedly from a carcass found thawing on Accutan Island in Alaska, which is in the Aleutian Island chains. And the meat was purportedly discovered by the, the well-known Arctic explorer, Father Bernard Rosencrantz Hubbard, um, and shipped back to New York City by the accomplished polar explorer, Captain George Costco of the US Navy. And the press really picked up on it, and it became sort of a national sensation, and the dinner went down in history, um, culinary history, and it became something of a legend. Um, and that is where the story would have remained, except in the Peabody Museum, the Yale Peabody Museum's vertebrate zoology collection sits the only known piece of meat served at this famous dinner. We acquired it from the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut in 2001, and I came across this when I was an undergraduate working in the collections. I was a student worker organizing the collections, and interestingly, the meat was never labeled as mammoth, but instead as extinct giant ground sloth. And it was sitting in the back of the collection, well taken care of, but pretty much ignored for 14 or so years. And this was always my favorite specimen. I thought it was 
amazing that uh, there was this giant ground sloth. And at the, on the specimen label in the back, it said, this is the meat of megatherium found and dug out of Ac Accutan Volcano and Accutan Island and the Aleutians secured by Captain George Costco. It is probably 250,000 years old and was served at an Explorers Club dinner. And this was Paul Howe's portion, which was preserved for the museum with the help of Commander Wendell Phillips Dodge. So there's some characters in this story that I'm going to come back to later. Um, but I just thought this was a fascinating specimen that we had in the museum. And that's where the story picks up again. So uh, I believe this was a few years ago. I was then a PhD student at Yale with a specialty in genomics. And Eric Sargis, who I mentioned, was my mammalogy professor, and, which is the study of mammals. And we, we were talking about xenarthrins, the sloth. Uh, group and he mentioned this specimen and if anyone wanted to do a genetic study on it to come up you know after class I ran up to him after class of course no one else did because <laughs> I knew about this specimen I was so excited about it um, turns out Matt Davis co-author of this work was a teaching assistant for that class and he was a member of the Explorers Club I had never heard of the Explorers Club in my life before I just knew we had this cool sloth specimen and Matt, Matt said they didn't eat sloth, they ate mammoth. Everyone knows the Explorers Club ate mammoth at the 1951 dinner. So from the start, there was this mystery. And then suddenly, there was a team that had the means to solve it. Uh, and I, I'm, I have a few kind of foods for thought. And I wanted to take a, a moment to kind of mention that you know, this crazy history aside, there were a number of very legitimate scientific aspects and questions that were pertinent to figuring out the identity of this specimen. But first, it's important to remember that eating your specimens used to be very encouraged until surprisingly recently. And I will say, many of us in fisheries, we still eat our specimens. I studied scallops for a while, and they are delicious. Uh, and for example, Charles Darwin of Darwin Finch fame and Galapagos Island, uh, in, his, in his book, Voyage of the Beagle, this is how much he wrote about the finches, his famous finches. And this is how much he wrote about what different South American animals tasted like, ranging from lizards to tortoises to frog bladders to birds to pumas. He talked about eating animals more than he talked about his finches in The Voyage of the Beagle, of course. Um, he even drank tortoise urine. Um, his review wasn't too positive of that. And so, I wanted to ask the audience again, what is the strangest or most exotic meal you have ever eaten? Feel free to put it in the Zoom chat or on Facebook comments. Um, I'd love to hear it. I have a few stories myself, having spent um, a lot of time living in South Africa and traveling the world. And so, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Number two, second food for thought. The images of mammoths frozen solid in clear blocks of ice have had a pretty big impact on how we view the Ice Age. And the Explorers Club mammoth is one of the most famous examples of this. So here is how newspapers portrayed the Berezovka mammoth, which was one of the most, maybe still one of the most complete mammoth carcasses ever found. And you can see workers here kind of chiseling this mammoth out of a block of ice, this giant ice cube. And here is what the mammoth actually looked like. Right? Frozen mammoths are found in, in, not in blocks of ice. They're found in, in permafrost, in frozen dirt, not in glaciers. And even Sir Charles Lyell, who is famous as one of the kind of fathers, so to speak, of geology and, and the theory of uniformitarianism that really influenced Dar Charles Darwin's thinking, um, it wasn't just a popular press problem, but scientists, um, you know, even he thought that mammoths were found frozen whole in icebergs. And many researchers actually resorted to ideas of catastrophism to explain the instantaneous freezing necessary to preserve palatable meat. And the issue was still debated well into the last century. And today, um, this sort of trope isn't necessarily going away. This is a picture at, a, at an exhibit in, at a museum in Texas that Matt took of this mammoth and what is supposed to be a big block of ice. And even if you look at the associated press photo that um, you'll often find kind of associated with studies on, on mammoth DNA, um, you see this mammoth and this ice 
and you know DNA just coming out like a slinky. So there are many misconceptions of you know of Ice Age mammoths and um, kind of some of the perceptions that we have about science and the Pleistocene, and and that that can be a problem um, for various reasons. And then lastly. If this meat were actually megatherium, actually giant ground sloth, it would significantly change what we know about sloths and paleobiology. So here is Accutan Island, where the frozen meat was supposedly discovered. And here is the known range of megatherium. And so if genuine, um, per the collection label in the Yale Museum, the Alaskan find would expand the latitudinal range of megatherium six times, 600%. And even if it were remains from some other ground sloth species, um, you know, some of which have been found as far north as Alaska and Canada, like the Jefferson's ground sloth, that this specimen would still represent a range expansion um, of thousands of kilometers and give key insights into you know, the significance and, and role of the Aleutian Islands um, during the Pleistocene. I'll also point out that um, there hadn't been, at least at that time, any records of humans um, eating giant ground sloths or, or human ancestors. And so this would have been kind of a novel component, too, of the first case of humans eating giant sloths, to, to our knowledge at the time. And so to solve this old mystery, I use a very modern technique that's called ancient DNA. And that essentially just means sequencing DNA from extinct organisms. Um, the first uh, kind of uh, study or ancient DNA study occurred in the early 1980s where they sequenced the DNA of the quagga, which was an ancient horse relative that went extinct about in the late 1800s. So that specimen was about 100 years old. And most recently, um, a mammoth, not a woolly mammoth, but they think a different species, was uh, DNA was extracted from a mammoth that was over a million years old, found from teeth in Siberia. And that study just came out last year. And so, um, the technology has advanced substantially and really pushed the boundaries of the organisms and age of organisms from which we can get DNA. Um, but you have to be really careful. It's really hard because DNA degrades over time, even in a very short amount of time of, of a, a dead animal, for example. So you have to be very careful. And I was laughing when I put this slide together because I'm wearing this mask here, which seems so normal right now, but that was, a long, that was for a few years ago. And so to work in the ancient DNA lab, um, what happens is that you're amplifying or you're reproducing sections of the, of the DNA. And because of how unstable it is and broken, you can preferentially amplify any other kind of modern DNA very easily. So it's very, very easy to contaminate your samples. So I worked in a very special ancient DNA lab only for ancient DNA studies. There were UV lights that went on when I left and, and stayed on before I came back to cleanse and, and remove the DNA. I had to wear a hairnet and special lab coat and make sure, and had goggles on, make sure that there was none of my DNA that could you know, contaminate our sample. I couldn't even walk into my regular DNA lab and then go into the ancient DNA lab. I either had to go home and take a shower and change my clothes or just go straight into the ADNA lab to, to prevent contamination. And so, like I said, we had a separate or a dedicated lab, and basically, <laughs> you have to understand that this meat, we didn't know how well it was preserved. It was an ethanol, um, a preservative, which is common for museum specimens, um, but it had been cooked in a stew. And so we had no idea whether we could even get DNA out of this thing. Um, there, I'd found a paper that you could extract DNA from like a microwaved organism once, so we had some precedence. Uh, but what I did was go in the middle, luckily we had a lot of meat. I went in the middle of the meat to try to get you know, the inside so it wasn't you know, to prevent contamination. And lo and behold, we were able to extract DNA from this thing. Very, very small fragments um, of DNA, but it's what you, know, you might expect from an ancient um, DNA sample. And then we were debating what methods to use to try to sequence that genome. And so what you do is you can sequence a small fragment, a certain gene, region, and then you can compare that to a database of other animals and you can see how similar your sequence is to those animals. Um, and, and how you kind of determine which part of the genome, which gene region you sequence depends on something that we call primers. And you can have primers that are species specific, so only woolly mammoth or only 
um, I don't know, elephant or only bison. And we tried to keep it pretty broad. We just used vertebrate primers <laughs> that were pretty vague. So we figured, okay, we could at least narrow it down to you know, um, a clade of organisms, maybe not specific species. Um, but actually, we got a pretty large segment of, of DNA, 370 base pairs. That's 370 A's, T's, G's, and C's that make up DNA. And what we did was we, we did what was called a blast search. And you can compare, like I said, your DNA with this blast search to an online global database called GenBank. Um, and that's what we did, or that's what I did. In the meantime, when I was in the lab, Matt Davis was uh, traveling all over and conducting a bunch of archival research. He went to um, the Yale Archives, the Bruce Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, the Explorers Club Research Archives, um, doing research on the main players who we knew were associated with this dinner. And what he found out was that a man named Paul Griswold Howe, shown here, was the curator director of the Bruce Museum in Greenwich at the time. And he was a seasoned naturalist and explorer. And he, he was going on an expedition, and he couldn't make the dinner. He knew he was going to miss the 47th annual dinner. But he heard that prehistoric meat was going to be served. And so he actually wrote to the Explorers Club asking for a piece, his portion of the dinner. Um, asking whether his tidbit could be preserved. He wanted to put it in the Bruce Museum. And I'll say that it was, it was announced before the dinner that something prehistoric was going, to be, was going to be served, but they weren't sure. So here he says Mastodon, but he's not sure. He paid $9.50. I'll say the price of the dinner has gone up significantly since then. Um, but he well, sent a bottle of preservative um, and Lo and behold, he, he got it, and um, that's what ended up in the Bruce Museum. And so when he, when he wrote to the club, he asked the dinner chairman, which was this man named Commander Wendell Phillips Dodge, um, if he could have that piece. And, and Dodge eagerly obliged. He personally filled out the specimen label, and he labeled it Megatherium. And that is the label that was carried with that specimen until the Peabody got it. But surprisingly, if you actually comb through the old newspapers like Matt did, he found that that sloth was actually the accepted identity of the dish served after or served um, at the at the dinner. And the for some reason though, this popular article by Christian Science Monitor said that it was a mammoth. And we don't know why, but for whatever reason, almost all later references to the this specific annual dinner claim that the meat was a mammoth. And this left um, some people confused, including uh, Paul House. He wrote to Dodge and said, hey, wait a minute. You know, this, this label says megatherium. I've been reading accounts that it's mammoth. Like, what is the specimen? I want to make sure I can clear up the matter. And at first, um, Dodge actually ended up writing a uh, kind of editorial in the Explorers Club Journal, which is a periodical that the Explorers Club puts out. And at first, he seemed very adamant that the meat was sloth. He says it. Um, and it's worth pausing here to mention that Dodge got into the Explorers Club by crossing what is now Syria, Iran, and Iraq by camel when he was 18 years old. Um, but during his day job, he was actually a well-known editor and writer for several magazines, including The Strand. Um, he was also the manager for the, the star Mae West and a a famous impresario in, in America and in Europe. And so he was skilled at using the news media to attract attention. And so in that editorial in the Explorers Club Journal, after claiming that the meat was sloth, he kind of jokingly cites, he goes on a little bit of a tangent, and he cites this nonsensical evidence um, that maybe there were, you know, the sloth was eating pteropods, which are these marine organisms, um, before finally admitting that he may have discovered a potion by which to turn Chelonia Midas into giant ground sloth from this volca volcano in the Aleutians. Chelonia Midas is green sea turtle. And as we know from the menu, it was served in um, the soup that day as an appetizer. And it was very common at that time to serve green sea turtle soup. Green sea turtles are unfortunately now endangered because of all the soup. Um, but it seems that Dodge may have, you know, taken some of the green sea turtle meat 
from the soup and claim that it was something else. But nothing would be able to tell us that except for the DNA. Um, and so we were really excited. As I was you know, submitting the sequences and kind of towards the end of the stage of, of my work, um, that's when we discovered this Explorers Club journal article. And so suddenly we were like, oh my gosh, good thing we chose those vertebrate primers because is it turtle? Like what? We were really surprised. And I will say, lo and behold, the meat was green sea turtle. The top 14 uh, matches on that blast DNA search were all green sea turtle. So I feel a little bit better now as a marine biologist. This talk is completely relevant to my work because we're in the ocean. <laughs> We've got green sea turtles. Um, and, and I'll say, too, we, we did you know, some rigorous testing. Uh, we double-checked the blast search with a maximum composite likelihood model and looked at genetic distances between samples. So how different was our DNA sequence, the turtle DNA sequence, from other uh, green sea turtles and from mammoths and from other ground sloths? This sloth here um, was the closest relative to megatherium for which there was a DNA sequence available at the time. And in, indeed, you know, the lowest, the shortest amount of um, distance or the most similarity between our sample was um, with green sea turtle. I also created a, phy a phylogeny or a, a, a tree depicting evolutionary relationships between our sample and other green sea turtle samples because we were, we were trying to figure out, oh, maybe we can, we can see where it actually came from because there's two kind of geographic um, clades of green, of green sea turtles, some found in the Pacific and some found in the Atlantic or Mediterranean. Um, Dodge claimed that it was off, collected off the coast of Burma. <laughs> Whether he's telling the truth or not is unclear. We weren't able to kind of really say, um, it was such a small DNA sequence, we weren't able to pinpoint kind of where that turtle specifically may have originated. Um, but I do want to point out that this wasn't the first time that turtles had been mixed up with mammoths and sloths. And so in 1914, a famous Italian poet um, supposedly also ate frozen woolly mammoth, and he said it tasted like tortoise flesh. And the famous uh, historian or, or naturalist Richard Harlan uh, once named a new species of sea turtle off of this bone here which later turned out to be the clavicle of a ground sloth. So apparently turtles and, claws, and sloths and mammoths have been confused before. But the question remains, why did people continue to believe that the meat was mammoth or sloth, you know, even after Dodge admitted it was a joke? And granted, the Explorers Club Journal um, you know, wasn't part of the popular press. And so when those articles were published like about the mammoth and the sloth was really stuck through history, but I, and I have to admit too that when I read his confession, it was very confusing and I was still not really clear what it might be. But I, I wanna to say too that he also created a very plausible story by claiming that the meat had been collected um, by this well-known Arctic explorer, Bernard Hubbard. Um, Hubbard was, was a lecturer at Santa Clara University in California. Um, he completed a lot of expeditions to Alaska. And so it was in fact, you know, believable that he could have perhaps found a mammoth. And Matt um, Davis perused through hundreds of photos from Hubbard's um, travels, and he, he didn't find anything that looked like sloth or mammoth. And Captain Costco was also a very well-known polar explorer. And since the dinner was Alaskan-themed, um, Costco actually did arrange for a 200-pound block of glacial ice to be flown from Juneau, Alaska to New York to, New York to chill the, the cocktails for the dinner. And so it wouldn't have been that much of a stretch to kind of just add a sloth or mammoth to the cargo and send that along too. And, and while Costco did collect some specimens for the Smithsonian, um, we couldn't find anything that independently linked him to a mammoth or sloth. And so it seems like even knowledgeable scientists like, like Paul Howes just took Dodge at his word. Um, and I think it's highly unlikely that, that Howes knew about this joke. Um, he may not have read the newsletter, and it's doubtful he would have you know, displayed this specimen in the museum um, had he known it was, was a fraud. 
And so I want to, given how legendary this meal was and the impact um, that one incident of eating mammoth you know, can have, we wrote this up, um, we, we published it in Plus One, it's open access so anyone can, can read it. It's probably the most unique and interesting scientific paper I've ever written, and maybe ever will. And I want to say too that our lovely specimen is still in the Peabody Museum. It's gotten a new specimen label in the herpetology uh, collections, not mammology. And uh, I want to also point out that Dodge, in his confession, um, ended, this, ended with this quote or by saying, science and all of its division must form the jury and decide the fate of the, shall we say, defendant. And I think that this is, a, I like this quote because if you recall, this dinner was in 1951 and the structure of DNA was only described in 1953. And so at the time, these guys had no idea that 65 years later, you know, two grad students would come along and solve this mystery. And I, I, I just think that's fascinating. And so I wanted to end with a couple of final thoughts. Um, and the first is that anyone who is curious can make amazing discoveries. You don't need a PhD. Um, you don't even need a master's degree. You can go outside and just be curious and, and take advantage of, of being interested in the natural environment and asking questions and exploring mysteries. Um, and then I also want to say that and really stress the importance of voucher specimens and, and the museums that preserve them. These are incredibly important. Um, museums are invaluable parts of our society and they play a huge role in scientific advancement. Um, and for this study particularly, you know, historical museum collection records like, and the metadata we say that people draw from those collections um, are often aggregated and they're used in these big macroecology studies or global analyses of biodiversity. But oftentimes these data are susceptible to numerous errors, which can be significant in this case, either from careless labeling or a mix-up or purposeful fraud. And so it's important to pay attention to the noise um, sometimes because it can really have an influence on what, how we perceive biology. The, the last thing I'll say is that um, there's a big push in publishing genomic data online and making it openly available, which is amazing in many ways. But the, um, the, this data often doesn't come with a voucher specimen, which is a physical specimen that is housed in a museum and has, is directly linked to that genomic information so that if you publish a genome of an African elephant, there is an African elephant in a museum somewhere, or parts of it, I guess, that's kind of a big example. Let's say you go take a salmon, and you have a salmon in a museum, you can say this genome comes from this salmon. Um, and, and there was a recent study that came out last year, and they, they found that it's actually pretty appalling how few voucher specimens we have. Only thir sorry, these numbers are small, but only 11% of all vertebrate genomes available on GenBank, that global database, have a voucher specimen. Um, for mammals, it's only about 3%, and for other organisms um, shown here, it's less than 20%. And so if, if there's any kids or students in the audience too, I wanted to, to add a final, a promise final um, little thought, and that's what will you discover 65 years from today? What kind of technologies or questions do you have and want to answer? Um, I'd love to hear it in the chat or the comments. And again, I, I, I want to emphasize that this was one of the, even though it was not necessarily related to my dissertation anyway, it was just a cool example of how we can use genomics and DNA to answer all sorts of mysteries and questions and um, engage with history and museums and modern science and technology. And um, it was a really fun experience to work with so many different people and, and, uh, and answer this, this big mystery. Uh, we found one other occasion where members of the Explorers Club claimed to dine on another extinct animal. Um, this was fossil horse, which was supposedly collected from Gold Creek. And if anyone is tuning in from Fairbanks, you probably know where Gold Creek is. Um, maybe there's several Gold Creeks. But this was collected by Coleman Shaler Williams. He was a paleontologist at the American Museum and a field assistant to George Gaylord Simpson, um, who's very famous in biology. And they claimed to cook a dish made out of the bone marrow of this fossil horse. And actually, I have um, the Explorer's Cookbook, and the recipe is in here for this, ex this extinct horse. Apparently, the dish was really delicious, but it called for four pounds of butter and a cup of salt. So 
that's saying something too. With that, I want to just end by saying thank you all, all so much for tuning in. Um, the, the work that I did was funded by the Explorers Club and the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies. There were several people who helped us um, solve this mystery that weren't the main players. And I'll, I'll briefly add that the Explorers Club has a bunch of public lectures um, that are available throughout the year, and a lot of them now are online. They have one coming up on Monday. It's Black History Month. Um, it's at 3 p.m. Alaska Standard Time, and their, their website is explorers.org. So if you're interested in the club, they have grants, um, research grants for high school students and college students, and um, lots of talks that are spanning all sorts of topics. So if you're interested, you can check them out. And with that, I would love to take any questions. Again, thank you so much for, uh, for the invitation to talk and for tuning in tonight. <clears throat> well, Dr. Glass, that was, that was fabulous. It was a little bit of history, a little bit of uh, almost like uh, some detective work, some crime detective work, uh, and some biology and some super modern science. So uh, we do have some questions from viewers. I've got a couple of questions, but I just for those who hadn't, uh, weren't following the chat, we got a lot of responses to your <laughs> questions there about strange things people have eaten. I just want to rattle off a couple of those. Uh, including rattlesnake, that was oh, wow. that was one there. Mongoose, kangaroo, sleeper shark, pony, uh, monkey, ostrich jerky, caribou heart, sea lion liver, guinea pigs. So uh, people have had quite the diet, and also people love the museums. Uh, I just jotted down a couple: uh, Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, the Smithsonian. Excuse me, uh, uh, Natural Museum of uh, National Museum of Asian Art, our very own UA Museum of the North, of course, uh, Natural History 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 Museum in Denver and in New York City. So people love museums. That's great. Let me um, let me just start with a, a question I had. Um, it, how much of this was a kind of a learning thing for you? You know it. Yeah, um, very. It, for me, it was a big learning curve, to be honest, because ancient DNA, although like the mechanism is the same, you you want to extract the DNA from the cells, so break down the cells of the tissue, and then you want to amplify it in some way, so make tons and tons and tons of copies of it. But the, I was, I will say, I was so nervous because we had like one shot, right? We had one piece of meat. And um, just learning, there, basically there were a bunch of kind of behind the scenes extra lab steps we had to do, not only to prevent contamination, but to make sure that you know, we, were, we were sure of what we were getting and, and that we had high enough quality DNA to be able to, um, to, to you know, go through it and, and use the methods and, and amplify that. And so I learned a lot, like a lot of it, we have a machine called Shake and Bake and you, to break down the DNA, you add some chemicals and you're, it's sitting there and shaking and it's a heated incubator. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of learning, just figuring out what primers to use, what, what kind of animals could this be? Could it also, we thought at some point it could have been like ancient bison or horse too. And so there were lots of questions, and, and I had a lot of support from the folks that had done ancient DNA work before, like Gisela. All right, let's, uh, let's dive into some viewer questions, all right? Uh, this one from the Rigo family. From some, from some young scientist in the making, I guess this question comes from, is it possible to reconstruct a mammoth from the DNA we now have? Uh, they've heard there's a Jurassic Park type place in Russia with that as a goal. Right, yeah, I was just reading up on the, the Pleistocene Park um, today, actually, because uh, there's been a lot of press about it recently. Um, that, I will say it's a, at this point uh, of, in time, it, I would say it's not very feasible because you have these tiny, tiny fragments of DNA because it gets broken up, broken up, broken up. And so, and, and of course you have no host. And there's been a bunch of work on, you know, resurrecting species like passenger pigeons, um, another recently extinct species, but I think we have a long, long way to go um, if it's ever even feasible to actually reconstruct a woolly mammoth. You would have to hybridize it with another species and have make sure that even if you could get parts of the genome, you know, is that embryo going to be viable? Will that animal be taken care of and things? So I would say it, it's, it's still very unlikely that that um, 
that technology is, is, is there and feasible. And, and of course, there's a lot of ethical questions about should it even happen too, which I won't go into specifically at the moment. All right, um, this is a question from Tim. Tim asks, how many more base pairs would you have needed to come close to identifying where the sea turtle was from? Oh, that's a great question, actually. Um, I, I'm not sure about the answer there um, because, as you can see, we did a very basic analysis, and if we had included perhaps more additional like s existing sea turtle specimens, um, it would have helped us. That the ba that gene region we were targeting, CO1, which is part of the mitochondrial um, genome, I believe, oh, I don't wanna misspeak, but I believe CO1 is about 600 to 800 base pairs long. And so we got about half of that. So maybe with the, with more, we could have figured that out. But um, it, not, it depends not only on the quality of our specimen, but also the quality of the other specimens or genetic data available that we were comparing it to. So even if, you know, they had an incomplete um, region and we had um, an incomplete region, if they'd overlapped completely with all of them, that would have helped, but maybe ours wasn't entirely overlapping. Like it wasn't the same exact base pairs. And so there's a, yeah, another number of factors that could have gone into that, but we weren't able to figure it out, unfortunately. So that kind of, I think, might lead into a question I have and that what have you seen in your time working with in, in DNA research, the tools that you have to use, what, what advances have you seen? Oh, there have been, I mean, from when I was an undergrad until now, there, it's just advancing so quickly. And I would say a lot of the work that I did, I don't know, 15 or so years ago is not obsolete, but like today, I would say if we used next generation methods, which is what you could which essentially is a, a new type of technique to get um, information from an organism across its entire genome instead of just targeting that one um, CO1 gene region, we, we might actually be able to figure out you know, where that turtle was from. Um, and, and the technology is just continuing to advance. When we, um, let me see if I can get this right now, it took about 13 years for us to sequence the human genome. And now you can go out and you can sequence the genome of an organism in just a few hours. That's the whole genome, uh, which is you know billions of base pairs. That's how far we've come in the last you know 20 or so years. Okay. Um, question from Marvin. Marvin asks, uh, any work done on the many frozen examples found in Siberia? I personally haven't done work on um, organisms from Siberia, but a, a lot of people are. And like that um, example of the mammoth that was over a million years old, that was um, sequenced from teeth from um, uh, two individuals, I believe, that were from Siberia. And what they found actually was that that wasn't a, a woolly mammoth. They think it was actually a different species that, that was even older than um, woolly mammoths. And, and Colombian mammoths because woolly mammoths and Colombian mammoths, t I, I don't believe were even real species. They hadn't even evolved yet a million years ago. So there is quite a lot of work done in Siberia. I am I am personally not doing work there. All right, this next question is from Duke, uh, way out in Bethel in Alaska's uh, Southwest. Uh, Duke asks, he, Duke says, I've heard a lot about people in the past eating mammoths. Has this ever been confirmed? Now I question everything I hear. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I should have added a slide with this. There, um, there have been instances where, um, you know, mammoth and other Pleistocene animal flesh um, found in the permafrost is, you know, pretty intact and um, conceivably edible. And I, and I. I believe there are a couple of instances where people, and maybe even a researcher here at UAF, um, not me, have eaten Pleistocene animals. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, in this case was like kind of an exceptional one, but I, I, I do believe that there have been actual cases of people, at least flesh, like I said, flesh that could be eaten um, because the, the carcass is so intact whether or not people choose to share they've tasted or not is, is not necessarily published all the time. Um, just a, another quick question from me. I, I saw toward the end in your presentation there, 
the words voucher voucher specimen. Can you kind of elaborate on what that is? Yeah, yeah. So a voucher specimen is just a physical specimen of an organism that is linked to um, some sort of data, whether that is genetic data or ecological data. It's a way for um, you know people, scientists, to to ground truth and fact check the data that they have. So oftentimes vouchers are really important if you're looking at morphology or the physical shapes and, or, and forms of organisms to compare or describe new species. You need a voucher that says this is, you know, this was collected from here and here's what it looks like. And so if, if um, there's ever any question, like let's say we publish the genome of this one species, um, we can go back and take more tissue from it and, and say, okay, we, we know that this is um, you know, a king salmon genome because we took this sample from this specific king salmon, which is housed in the UAF museum. It's just, it's a way to, to, to make sure that there's physical evidence for um, the data that might not have a physical component. It might be in the cloud somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> another, uh, another question from a viewer. This is from Patricia Lakanoff Gregory. Uh, Patricia asks, on obtaining the DNA, can it come from just the bone uh, also? There was the, oh boy, the Desmosto, Demostolus, maybe? Uh, and she has spelling in, in uh, brackets there. D-E-S-M-O-S-T-O-L-Y-U-S. -S -S. There was, that was found in Unalaska. They say it was 26 million years old. Where would that have traveled from? Oh man, I'm not entirely sure what Demostylus is. 26 million years old. Um, I, well, you can get DNA from bone um, specimen, and so, or from tusks, uh, or from teeth. And so, what likely happened in that case is that um, if it's a, if that animal, I'm sorry, I don't know what it is. If that's a Pleistocene animal, um, it's likely that they could extract the DNA and, or look at the fossil and figure out what the animal was and then you can look at the sediment in the rock that it's in and you can carbon date that back to 26 million years um, and, and see how old that was based on the habitat that it's in, not necessarily from the DNA itself but from the surrounding rocks and, and, and um, sediment. Uh, we have another Jurassic Park sort of question, all right. Uh, this is from uh, Tim Hayes, Timothy Hayes. He says, you spoke to the challenges of bringing back a long extinct species. What about more recent species that have gone extinct due to man? Is this perhaps something more realistic? Yeah, that is a great question, and I was going to touch on that, so I'm glad that um, you asked that. And, and I'll say that there, um, there's already been some work, and I can give one example that comes to mind that Gisela Cacone, one of our partners, has been working on in the Galapagos with the Galapagos tortoises. And what they have found is that, um, so back when people were colonizing and exploring the Galapagos, you know, boats would take these tortoises and then they would be too heavy, they'd just drop them off and the tortoises, like out in the water, and the tortoises would drift back to shore or they'd move them from island to island. And so, although all of the, several of the Galapagos Islands used to have unique tortoise species, a lot of them got intermixed over time. And some of those have now gone extinct. And what they found, I can't remember how long ago this was, but what they found was that they actually found DNA of one of those extinct species of Galapagos tortoises in one of the, um, in a living, you know, Galapagos tortoise. And so the idea is that, and I think it was pretty recent, like it maybe was um, an, an F2 or F3 generation. So the idea would be that you could find those tortoises who have a lot of ancient tortoise DNA in their genome. So maybe they were, maybe their parent, because tor Galapagos tortoises live like 100 to 200 years, so maybe that parent tortoise was one of the extinct species, and you could, um, you know, breed those tortoises and try to re uh, breed for the extinct species genome, if that makes sense. So there, that's like one example I think that's really fascinating that comes to mind, that where people are looking at captive, like conservation breeding based on the genomes, knowing that there was an extinct species and that there were very, very very recent relatives of that species that um, you could conceivably use to, to kind of resurrect the, the genome at least and improve, in that case, improve genetic diversity, which we know is linked to population health. Okay. Uh, 
Here's another DNA question. This is from Tim Coeran. Uh, apologies, Tim, if I've got that not quite right. Tim asks, when you're looking at a chunk of DNA derived from a piece of meat, how do you know it's mitochondrial DNA versus nuclear? Yeah, that's a great question. So all of the meat would have um, both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Like all of our um, cells have that too, um, except for red blood cells. And so we, we specifically were looking at mitochondrial DNA and not nuclear DNA, um, partially because it's a small fragment and that CO1 um, gene region that we were targeting is really popular. It's the, it's the barcode gene that a lot of um, organizations worldwide are using to kind of document biodiversity by sequencing the same region across all different life. So we could have sequenced nuclear DNA if we wanted to, but we specifically chose the mitochondrial gene region so that we could compare it to the, the database called GenBank. Okay. Sticking with the DNA theme, all right. This is a question from J. Veronica Cockerell. What do you need from the specimen to sequence it? Uh, and in parentheses, flesh or bone or something else? Yeah, so in, in, um, in our case, we just had flesh, but um, oftentimes it would be better to have bone because uh, you can dig into you know, the inner parts of the bone and you have less risk of contamination than something like flesh. Well, yeah, less risk of contamination, and also it's a lot rarer to find flesh that's preserved and has a high enough quality. So, so bone is usually the ancient DNA um, kind of go-to source instead of flesh. Okay. Um, viewers, we've got time for a couple more questions if you want to send them in. I'm going to go ahead and ask um, kind of what, what surprised you as, you as you set out to unravel this mystery, because I'm thinking a scientist starting on something like this should go in with an open mind, right? Did you have any preconceived ideas that, oh, this can't be a mammoth or, you know, that? And what surprised you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was definitely surprised that it was sea turtle. I, I remember getting the, I mean, because we take, you know, in this case, which was a rare exception, right? We, this is a we got this, uh, the specimen from a very legitimate museum. We were a very legitimate museum and still is. And so to have that kind of misinformation is, is very rare. <laughs> um, and that I think was surprising to, to see. Once we got this sort of confession, which was again, very confusing and I wish I could have shared more of it because it's really weird, weirdly written. Um, I was like, wow, okay, turtle? Like that was just a, a curveball. Um, and, and of course it makes sense. And I, I think that, yeah, I guess one of the mo other most surprising um, components was, was that we even were able to get DNA from this meat that we know had been cooked in a stew. Um, that was a pretty remarkable day because just to see, okay, what we've done so far, all the time we've put in so far and trying to extract it and make sure the protocol's perfect, that worked. All right, I think we're, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I think we're going to kind of, we'll, we'll kind of wrap that up. You, you talked a little bit about, you, you know, the importance of this kind of work that museums do. Um, people often don't see that when they go to a museum. They see the displays, the exhibits, but beh behind all that, maybe even underneath, like at our museum here, this other work is going on to unravel mysteries. Maybe. You know, you could talk a little bit more about the importance of that part of what a museum does and yeah, why it's so important. Right, yeah, for sure. I, I don't want to say the wrong stat, but it's the vast majority of museums' collections are not available to display to the public simply because of lack of space. And some museums will have like rotating collections. Um, and, and a few years ago, you know, this work got picked up by the press, and, and actually there was a um, what channel is it? The History Channel had a mystery at a museum episode that was that talked about this work. It was filmed and without our permission. We were never actually told that the um, episode was taking place and weren't portrayed correctly in the film either. And what really struck me with that was that they, in the with paid actors, they showed. Um, this dusty old museum and a man looking at DNA with a magnifying glass. And I, th I thought it was so sad that the true 
way of how museums work just wasn't shown. It was an easy way to show, hey, this thing was kept very, very clean and secure in our collections in the back, um, along with the, all the other mammals. And um, I, I, that kind of struck me as like, we think of museums as these dusty, old, dark places. Um, we, we see how they're portrayed in the media, but actually this, the ancient DNA lab was, you know, that's an entirely sterile, clean room. There's a lot of amazing advanced work going on, um, like using um, CT scans to look at fossils, and uh, a lot of cool work that's being done behind the scenes that's actually really modern, even though the, the things that we study might be really historic. I don't know if that answered your question. No, but it does, it does. <laughs> it just yeah. shows how much is going really on behind the scenes.